Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, to the webinar of SciFest. Um, today, is you, if you have any questions that you want to ask, please, you can raise a hand and also you can drop them on the chat box. Today's topic is talking heads, what bones, stones, and DNA tells us about human evolution. Today's speaker is Dr. Ian McKay. Dr. Ian McKay is an education and outreach specialist for the Center of Excellence in Paleo Sciences and the Evolutionary Studies Institute of the University of Fasorad. He has a PhD in paleontology, a teaching diploma, and has completed many business courses. His research interests include public perception, understanding of geosciences, school education, as well as the beautifully preserved 90 million year old fossil insects from Oraba, Botswana, which have so much to reveal about climate change and evolution. He's one of the South African Council members for the International Geoscience Education Organization. He's passionate about promoting sustainable geotourism and involving the public in the geosciences with his outreach program called Paleontology for All. He has over 24 years of experience in science as well as education. Um, welcome you, Doc, and please end over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with you today. And I'm hoping that you are, we're going to really have an interactive discussion about human evolution. Normally, this workshop is one that I would do face to face. And then you would be interacting with one another and discussing things. So this format is a little bit different for me, but I hope we're going to have a lot of fun. Um, discussing human evolution, looking at the skulls and all that kind of thing. And I hope you're all gonna interact with me um, as much as possible. So please, this isn't meant to be a formal kind of session. If you have a question, just ask it, stick up your hand maybe, huh? Um, but that's the great thing. And now what we're gonna do before we start is we're just gonna have a little poll or maybe just to find out what you know about human evolution as it is. And um, Ryan, do you want to put up the poll? Okay, you should all be seeing it now. There's six different questions, so scroll all the way down and answer all of them. people can answer sorry Ian. um yeah i'm, I'm seeing I think, two out of six people have voted is that right i'm not i'm not sure if the cyphers team are answering but i think we can end it end it yeah okay um and sure yeah Okay, should I? Okay, yeah. Yeah, we, we can see your screen. I think you can go ahead, Ian. All right, so should I just click on you? There you go. All right, so um, this is my talk. What do bones, stones, and genes, what can they tell us about human evolution? Now, I know I'm uh, from having talked about human evolution to many school students over the years. And also if you look at, on social media platforms, um, you see that there are many, many people that do not like the idea that humans have evolved. There have been polls and there's been all sorts of research that shows that, th that a large proportion of people do not accept the idea that humans have evolved from other animals. So it's kind of controversial, isn't it? 
So what we're going to look at today and what I'm going to show you and what we're going to discuss, <laughs> can you believe we, we've got load shedding? So hopefully a um, backup power generator is going to come on soon. So I'm sitting here in the dark. Some of the lights are still on. Anyway, so what we're going to talk about today is the evidence for human evolution. Right, and so the objective of this workshop will to be create a family tree of humans and their close relatives using bones, stones, and genetic information. Now you can see me in the dark. I hope that we're gonna have a bit more light soon. Ah, oh, there you go. Thank goodness for generators. Okay, so we're going to be looking at all this different evidence, and we're going to, and I, hopefully, I'm going to convince you if you aren't, if you are a bit doubtful that there is abundant scientific evidence for the evolution of humans from other species of animals. All right, so let's start with the bone, should we? So, um. Over the years, um, scientists, paleoanthropologists, that's the name of, of the particular branch of science that studies human evolution, have discovered thousands upon thousands of fragments of um, human ancestors called hominins, right? Um, usually they might, they'll find a tooth or a little fragment of a spinal cord or a bit of a rib, but every now and again, they find an almost complete skeleton, which is a cause of great celebration, um, but complete skeletons of human ancestors are actually very, very rare. Um, if you're lucky, you find a skull. So what we're gonna to discuss today mainly is evidence from skulls. And I have in front of me a whole bunch of skulls. Most of them are replicas. Um, and we'll be comparing them and looking and then I'll just discuss each skull, tell you a little bit about their names, where they come from. All this is very important if you're gonna be writing this, if you're gonna be discussing human evolution in the metric exam. So let's begin at the beginning. And the first skull that we are gonna look at is this one here. So now does anyone in this audience want to guess what that skull belongs to? So we're talking about humans and fossil ancestors and close living relatives. Anybody want to have a bash? Mm. You're a silent Chimpanzee. Hey. <laughs> what do I hear? Chimpanzee, that's correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a chimpanzee. And its scientific name is Pan troglodytes. Now, People so often say, but where do scientists get these names from? Why can't they think of something simpler? Um, actually, each of these names has a real meaning behind it. And when you understand the meaning, then it is easier for you to remember the names. And by using them often, you'll become familiar with them. And it won't just be an exercise in memorization. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the name. Pan means universal, okay? Think of the Pan-African sports where all the African countries participate, right? And a troglodyte is an underground dweller. And I'm not sure why chimps are called Pan, the universal underground dweller, because we all know that chimpanzees are generally not found in caves. But anyway, that's the name, pan troglodytes. Now, the next one, skull that we're going to look at is this one over here, which I think is perhaps one of the most famous of all the hominin fossils or human ancestors that have been found in South Africa. Do any of you remember this one? Hmm. Okay. There's an answer on the chat box. It says it's um, Africanus, Mrs. Plus, AU Africanus. 
That's it, right. This is Mrs. Plays, right? The famous Mrs. Plays. Um, found when? About 1947. And she was named Plesianthropus at first. And the, when they announced this wonderful discovery in the newspapers, the journalists got a bit tired of saying Plesianthropus. And so she got called Mrs. Plays. Now there's some debate about whether she's a Mrs. or a Mr. Plays. Um, but anyway, this is Mrs. Plays and his or her formal scientific, maybe this is the first transgender fossil, huh? her for, uh, formal scientific name or his formal scientific name is Australopithecus africanus. And Austral means Southern, think of Australia. Pithecus means ape. So if you're learning about human evolution, there are all sorts of fossils, this Gigantopithecus and oh, there are many, many Pithecuses there. So this is the Southern ape from Africa. And the next one is, can you remember this one? This is Australopithecus sediba. So the Southern ape and sediba, it means the source. Okay, so this is a Swana word for source because when Lee Berger and his team, uh, well, and his, his son actually found this and when they were analyzing it, they thought that it looked much more like modern humans than anything else that had been discovered before. So they reckoned this was the source of humanity and Sediba means source or well or river or something like that. The next one doesn't come from South Africa. Uh, it's one of my favorite fossils though. This one comes from Kenya. And this is, anybody know it? Yes, there is an answer on the chat box. It says it's the Erectus or Ergaster. Yeah, that's it. This is Homo Erectus or Ergaster. We definitely have uh, an expert somewhere in the audience here. I wonder who that might be. All right, so Homo. Um, we homo sapiens, meaning person or man, erect as in upright, they stood erect, and ergaster meaning working man or working person. And there's a little bit of debate amongst the paleoanthropologists whether this is one species or two species. So some say, well, the ones we find in Africa are ergaster, and, the, and these are actually have been found in Indonesia, uh, Asia, they've been found in quite a large number of localities around the world. So there are those that say the non-African ones are erectus, the upright, the upright person. And here, okay, so this is, should be obvious, gorilla, gorilla. And you can just see that it's very, rather different from all the others. And gorilla, means so does can anybody remember this one yeah gorilla is tribe of hairy woman because when Linnaeus named the, the gorilla he knew about the Greek legends which spoke of these hairy women in Africa this group of hairy women and he thought well that this is a representative of that ancient tribe. So gorilla means tribe of hairy woman. I don't know where the Greeks thought the guys came from. This is the skull of my uncle Albert. Um, you'll see him just now. And he belongs to our species, thank goodness. Homo sapiens, all right, person or man and sapiens as in wise. So the wise person, that's a human. And then the last one here is everybody's favorite. This is Homo again, um, oh, person, oh, human, Naledi. Yeah, everybody knows that, hey? The star, the Naledi, because the, this particular species was found 2013 and in the rising star cave system, um, which is near Statfontaine Caves. And there are these crazy bunch of adventurous people that go caving and exploring these caves. And they actually named the different cave systems. And this was called the Rising Star. And while they were exploring these caves, they accidentally came upon these remains, which just happened to be 
this wonderful, wonderful find of Homer and the lady. Pretty cool, hey? So these are the skulls that we're going to look at, and I'll talk a little bit about hands and feet and the rest of the skeletons. I mean, we actually really, really fortunate in this country. We've got almost a complete skeleton of Homer and the lady and a pretty complete skeleton of Sadiba. And I'll show you just now, at the end of this, when I walk, because I am presenting to you from the Homan and Vault here at Witz University, which is where many of these remains are kept. And we've got Littlefoot, which is an incredibly complete um, skeleton, but, which we're not going to talk about in this workshop, but it's a totally wonderful and complete skeleton. All right, so let's carry on and we can get to the skulls now. So what are we going to look at? We're going to be looking at these skulls. We're going to be comparing them, different features. So yeah, we're going to be looking at the size of the canine tooth. That's an important one, important feature to look at when you're examining a skull and you want to know, is this skull that I found in the, the felt, is this like a, just, just a, an extant um, non-human ape? Or is it maybe a fossil human ancestor or hominin? We'll be looking at the shape of the palate. That's another thing you could look at. We can look at the base of the skull and where the spinal cord fits into the skull. And that there's a hole there where, the, where your spinal cord goes into your skull and it's got the name of foramen magnum. And now we're going to look at the snout. There you go, the snout, right? How far does it project? That's another important feature. And then we're going to look at the cheekbones. Are they kind of vertical or do they flare out? Do they separate? And we're going to look at the shape of the forehead. We'll also look at the eyebrow ridges, by the way. There are a couple of other things we're going to discuss. And also we're going to worry about brain size because, I mean, we are the wise human, aren't we? And as such, we um, are supposed to be more intelligent than other species. And of course, the more intelligent you are, the bigger your brain or not. We'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. So now we're going to move on to, I'm going to show you the skulls of the different species. And we're going to be looking at these different characters. All right. So now let me just get my um, little... Flashy thing. Okay, so there our species are along the top. Pan troglodytes, Australopithecus africanus, Mrs. Plays, Australopithecus sediba, the source, Homo erectus or Augusta, the tribe of hairy woman, the gorilla, my uncle Albert, Homo sapiens and Homo naledi. All right, so those are the different species we're going to be looking at. And we're going to look at the size of the canine tooth. We'll start at the bottom here. The shape of the palate, okay, the, or the dental arcade. Ooh, what happened there? Um, the cheekbones, how far the face protrudes. And I'll talk a little bit about their feet and their hands, although we're not going to sh I'm not going to show you that today. Whether they walked upright or on all fours eyebrow ridges, and so on and so on. So let's start with pan troglodytes, right? So this is the chimpanzee, remember that? Pan, the universal underground cave dweller. And the first thing we're gonna be looking at is the shape or the size of the, the canine tooth. So yeah, the canine tooth is, think about your little eye tooth that you've got in your head. It's got also a pair of in, these incisors that really stick out, eh? If you had incisors like that, you'd be off, your parents would take you off to the orthodontist and they'd put braces on you. And then there's a gap between the canine tooth and the incisors called the diastema. So a chimp, I would say, has got a really, really large canine tooth. Yeah? So that's the chimp. 
the next thing we're going to look at the and this is Mrs. Place, right? Australopithecus africanus. Now, alas, Mrs. Place got blown out of stag plane caves with a stick of dynamite, and she lost, or he lost, her teeth, his teeth in the process. So she doesn't have any teeth for us to look at. But we do have other specimens of Australopithecus africanus. And I would say they do definitely do not have a large canine tooth like a chimp, but maybe a medium or smallish one. And it's certainly they don't have a diastema or incisors that project in quite the same way as a chimpanzee. So you'll just have to take my word for it that Australopithecus africanus does not have this huge canine tooth. But I can show you the teeth of Australopithecus sediva, hey, remember? The southern ape from the source. And can you see there, where is the canine tooth on this? There's a nice one. Can you see it's kind of larger than the others, but it's nothing at all like the chimp, right? If you compare a chimp and compare this one, look at the incisors, there's no gap there, there's no diastema. So yes, rather different from the chimp as our baseline. And then we can look at, oh yes, yeah, we have Homo erectus. And again, I'm afraid you're gonna have, this, this lady has lost most of her teeth. And so you're just gonna have to take my word for it that she did not have a large canine tooth like the chimpanzee. Other Homo erectuses have been found and it's definitely not large and protruding like the chimp. All right, so yeah, yeah, let's just show you. Okay. So she lost all the front teeth. The gorilla, on the other hand, huge canine teeth, huh? Look at that. Let me just take this out the way. All right, so you can see there's a huge canine tooth here, the diastema, the incisors stick out. So definitely, definitely more like the chimp and less like saliva. And I can show you my Uncle Albert, if you want to see him. Let's just get this right for the camera. As you can see, typical human, no large canine teeth huh? and definitely not in need of an orthodontist pretty straight incisors and really quite difficult to tell the canine tooth apart from the other teeth i hope you all agree with that huh? and then yeah we have the lady okay and again as you can see the canine tooth is almost indistinguishable from the other teeth. So if we go and fill our table in, just quickly. For teeth. We would, could say that the chimp is large. Africanus not applicable, but it would definitely be small or medium compared to a chimp. Sediba me a medium, erectus not applicable, but again, small or medium. Gorilla extra large, I hope you agree. And Homo sapiens small, and the lady small to medium, maybe. So there you've got your teeth. Okay. So now we're going to look at the next we'll look at two characters, or three, I think, together. We'll look at the um, palate, the, the, the um, shape of the palate. Tap your palate like this. We're gonna look at the cheekbones. Are they vertical or do they kind of stick out? Are they large? And we're gonna also look at how far the face protrudes. All right, so that's what we're gonna do next. We'll look at those three characters for each of the, the different, the different um, species. Yeah?
Right, here you go. So we'll start again with a chimp, right? Wonderful chimp. So we're going to look at a couple of things, huh? We're going to look at the shape of the palette. And yeah, you've got a choice of just two. Is the palette long? Is it parallel sided? Or is it curved? So what has a curve so you can decide? Let's have a look. The, my Uncle Albert is, right? So we could call that curved or parabola shaped. And in this case, we would say it's parallel. Okay, so a chimp has got this parallel sided elongated pellet and that's because its snout sticks out so much. We say it's prognathous. Think of a dog. A dog's got this long snout and also this parallel sided mouth. Okay. And then the other things I said we were going to talk about are the cheekbones. And can you see that, that this has got a very, very broad face, huh? Very broad like this. Compare this to my Uncle Albert, who has got a, a, really nar a relatively narrow face. So we call these flaring cheekbones. And the reason is that the muscles attach to the top of the head and they go down there through these gaps in the cheekbones there, down to the lower jaw. And we humans who don't spend our life chewing and uh, food we don't, and uh, fighting off our enemies with our teeth don't have such big gaps as a chimp does. So the, the muscles go through from the top of the um, skull down through that gap in the cheekbones. It's called the zygomatic arch and attached to the lower jaw. And chimps have got large muscles and we've got small ones. So we just have a much narrower face. All right, so the flaring cheekbones, we can say, right? Let's have a look at Mrs. Plays. She may, Mrs. Plays may not have teeth. Let's just get this right for the camera. But you can see that um, Mrs. Plays has got a parallel sided um, palette. And if you look at the face like this, clearing cheekbones as well, rather similar to the chimp. And the other thing is if you put them next to one another like this, you can see that Mrs. Plays's jaw does protrude, but not nearly as much as the chimp. All right, and then we can just put Sadiba next to there. To, 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 the, to this one here. Let's have a look at the sleeve. Can you see the parallel sided mouth? Protruding jaw, but not as much as even Mrs. Clay's, right? I can put them next to one another like this. You can see Mrs. Clay's jaw protrudes far more, right? And um, If you look at the cheekbones, and this is one of the impressive things about Sidiba, it's got a much narrower face than a chimp, which has got this clear flare. So this narrower face is way more like a human, right? I'll show you the human just now. If we bring this Homo erectus in now, and let's compare Homo erectus to Sidiba. Well, I'd say, I suppose it is curved, but pretty parallel at the back there. Um, but can you see also that the face does not protrude that much? Maybe it could be just one more. So Sadiba, if I line them up nicely, has got a slightly more protruding face than, than Homo erectus. 
Now, what's very interesting is it is thought that Homo erectus was maybe one of the first species that started to use fire. And when you start using fire, you cook your food um, and you don't have to spend your whole life chewing and therefore having powerful jaws with large teeth is not so important. And by a complicated feedback, then ultimately you can get away with having smaller teeth. And, and if you've got smaller teeth, then you don't, don't have such a protruding face. Now, gorillas definitely look at that, at, at how far that face protrudes, parallel sided, large canines, elongated teeth, fairly large. These are vegetarians, remember, so they're going to have to spend, or mostly vegetarian gorillas, most of the days wandering around in the forests and foraging for vegetarian, for vegetable matter that's not so easy to digest. So for them, other than for defense, having large, powerful teeth for breaking down vegetable matter is very important. We've already discussed my Uncle Albert. Can you see the curved palate? They're beautifully curved. And small little teeth, eh? We eat really refined teeth. Um, food and you can even see over hundreds of years how the size of our teeth in modern humans has decreased compared even to our ancestors in size and the face definitely does not protrude at all or not much at all let's just put these two next to one another so you can compare mrs place to a, a modern human and you can see Mrs. Pleasure's face protrudes a lot more. And then the last one that we're going to look at is the lady. Very interesting. Can you see the beautifully curved palette? The teeth are larger than that of a modern human. And if you put them next to one another, I'll try and do it for you and line them up. You can see that the lady's jaw protrudes a bit further than the modern human. Okay, so let's quickly fill in our table and compare the skulls. All right, so we're going to look at the dental arcade. That's the shape of the palate. Is it parallel or curved? It always takes a little bit of time to respond. Now do it here. All right, so P stands for parallel. So a chimp, definitely parallel, the shape of the palate. Sediba parallel, erectus or augusta, I think parallel, you can argue with me. Gorilla, definitely parallel. Humans curved, and the lady has got a rather beautifully curved palate. And if we think about the cheekbones, are they parallel as in a human or flaring apart? then we can see that, well, a chimp flaring, Africanus flaring, Sediba um, parallel or straight might be better, a better way to do it. Erectus parallel, gorilla definitely flaring, human parallel or straight, and the lady um, parallel or straight. And how far does the face protrude? Now, I've got, got two things. I'm actually, I put them in sequence for you. So number one, so pan troglodytes is extra and has an extra protruding face. 
and it's the second. So we'll, I'm just, those numbers, if you line up all the skulls beautifully in order of who's protruding the most, this is, the, that will be the order that they'll be in. So Africanus is protruding, it's got the third most protruding skull. Sediba protruding the fourth most uh, protruding. Am I saying it right? Then Erectus is almost flat. Gorilla is first, the taste, it's got by far the most protruding face, if you remember rightly. And then Homo sapiens, we have got the flattest face, the least protruding. And the lady, well, if you look at them very carefully, I think that, so we've got, humans have got the flattest face, then erectus, then the lady, and then all the others have got more protruding faces. Just some other things to bear in mind. For most of these species, they have got a foot or some idea of how the foot functioned. And if you look at a chimp and a gorilla, for example, if you look at, the, at their feet and their hands, they're very similar. The chimps and gorillas can use their feet and their hands for climbing around in trees in exactly the same way. They put like this opposable thumb. Um, but Africanus, Sediba, uh, and Africanus and Sediba had a slight gap between the big toe and the rest of the foot and the rest of the foot. So it looks as if they could use their feet for gripping branches, not as well as a chimp or a gorilla though, but they could, they were still a bit of an opposable big toe that they could use for gripping branches. On the other hand, erectus, humans and the lady we've got a we've got no gap at all between our big toe and the rest of the and the rest of the the toes on the foot or hardly any gap and we've got a, a nice um heel and an arched foot our feet are adapted for walking on the ground and the interesting thing is that's what you find in the lady humans and erectus let's just put that in so pantrogdodites have got a gripping foot a bit the foot and the hand functioning almost exactly the same way. Africanus, well, we can say partially gripping, right? Sediba, partially gripping. Erectus, non-gripping, a foot adapted for walking. Gorilla has got a gripping foot. Humans, non-gripping, definitely. So us, Erectus and the lady, all non-gripping. And then the other thing, that we can um, look at is a precision grip, right? So I'll just show you with the other camera. I think it will be easier. So this is my hand and I can easily put my thumb against all my fingers. I can do this, right? I could pick up this piece of string yeah, very easily, right? So that is called a precision grip, where I can put my thumb against the other fingers and pick up something small. A chimp, however, has got a small little thumb uh, relative to the other fingers, and actually they can kind of do that. They can pick up things, but much more awkwardly, and that's a non-precision grip, right? So this is something that we, as humans share with Homo erectus, Naledi, and Sediba. Except Sediba and the lady had this curved hand, these curved fingers. It seems to be an adaptation for gripping branches. Whereas for us, we just can actually, it's easy for us to flatten our hand completely and utterly. We don't have to, we don't have this shape to our hand for gripping. And Erectus would have had a hand like ours. Let's quickly go and fill in the table again. It just takes a little while to become there we are. So precision grip, pan is no, non-precision grip. Africanus, 
Yes, but I don't know how many complete hands of Afrikaners they've actually found. Sliba, definitely. Erectus, yes. Gorilla, no. Us, yes. Naledi, yes. So basically, Naledi, humans, Erectus, and Saliba, well, maybe we, we could all, all of these species could have maybe played the piano. No, I'm joking. But with a precision grip, the argument is that you could possibly start making better tools. Although we do know chimps and bonobos, the close relatives, also use tools and can make tools, but possibly they could, wouldn't be capable of doing what we can do with our nice hands. Now we get to the big, the, the kind of the, the characters that really, really are becoming important. And that is whether you walk upright or you bipedal, you can't see me now, but you know, upright or on all fours, like a dog. So a dog would be quadrupedal, humans, other than when we babies, spend most of our life um, being bipedal, okay? And so unless you've got the complete skeleton of an animal, how can you tell whether it's bipedal or quadrupedal? Well, fortunately, the skulls actually do give us a lot of information about whether these creatures were bipedal or quadrupedal. So let's go back to the camera. All right, so yeah, we have a chimpanzee, right? And if we turn the chimpanzee over, let's just try and get you nicely with the skull. Do you see these are, there is a hole there It's a bit difficult to get this. That's better. Can you see that hole? That's called the foramen magnum. And this is where the spinal cord actually goes into the skull. And in a chimp skull, it is more towards the back of the skull. Okay. And this is also the base of the, sc the skull, yeah. And let's see now, if I can just show it to you like this. That base of the skull suggests that this animal, the skull was attached to the rest of the body like this. So the foramen magnum is at the back, suggesting that the spinal cord went into the back of the skull. And the base of the skull also shows that the, that the head was kind of positioned against the body like this. So this chimp, and we know that, spend most of the time on all fours, although they can walk erect at times when they want to. All right, so from looking at the skull, just looking at the base of the skull and the foramen magnum, is it more towards the center of the skull or more towards the back? You can get an idea of whether that creature was, was bipedal or quadrupedal, even though you, it might be an extinct species and you have no idea, you would never have actually seen it in action. Right, so now let's have a look at Mrs. Plays. Again, can you see the foramen magnum? But now compared to the chimp, it's further forward. And if you look at the base of the skull, it's more like this. So this is evidence that this was bipedal, although possibly not as upright as us. Maybe it sort of walk, Mrs. Please walk more with a forward slouch. So again, you look at the position of the foramen magnum. How far forward is it or back, right? And it should be. Definitely more towards the back, I think. I'll see if I can compare the two for you um, than a chimp. And the base of the skull, which also suggests that Mrs. Place was bipedal. Sediba? All right. Again, yeah, the base of the skull is. All right. 
and you can see the foramen magnum is more towards the front. So that was another thing that impressed the team that found Sediba was that it was even a stronger, more upright walker than Australopithecus africanus, than Mrs. Place. And by the way, before you ask me, um, when this skull was first found, they kind of prepared it using mechanical means and they saw this yellow stuff is, was what they uncovered and the rest was left in rock. And then they used an X-ray machine um, to actually look through the rock to look at the base of the skull. So they didn't damage the skull any, even further. So this is actually a complete skull. The yellow is just what they uncovered physically and the white is what they saw with the X-ray machine, the CT, micro CT scanner is the fancy name. All right, so that's Sediba. And yeah, we have Erectus or Ergaster. And there's no question, I hope, that you can see how far forward that full name and name them is, that Erectus deserves their name. They were definitely the upright human man, whatever you want to call it. And the skull balances quite nicely on my hand like this. You can see it's balanced for walking upright. Well, a gorilla, we don't have to ask many questions there. Eh? I mean, look at the base of the skull. No doubt about it, this, is, this guy is quadrupedal. And the foramen magnum right at the back. But there's a beautiful picture that you should actually Google. It's on the internet of um, two gorillas in Uganda imitating humans. And they are standing upright, just like soldiers. So they might have the skull, but gorillas can really, really, if they want to, they might not be quadru they might be quadrupedal most of the time, stand completely upright. And just think of all those movies you've seen where the gorillas beat their chests and charge the humans. So obviously they can stand upright as well. Right, and who's left? Oh, Naledi. Yes, Naledi. Right, here we are. One of the Naledi skulls. And no question about it. That foramen magnum is pretty far forward. And the base of the skull upright, hey? So remember that, and then quickly we'll look at the eyebrow ridges, should we? So this is a chimp, pretty big eyebrow ridges, hey? And a low forehead. Mrs. Plays, the same. quite large eyebrow ridges and a low forehead. Another thing I want you to notice as well is there's this pinch, yeah, in the forehead. So this tells you something about this, the brain structure. So our forebrain is supposed to be pretty important. The size of your forebrain is supposed to, that forebrain is supposed to function for higher thought. So the bigger your forehead, the bigger your forebrain, the more intelligent you're supposed to be. And if you've got a mighty big pinch here, then you don't have a big, fo a big forebrain, right? And you can see it's called a post-orbital, which means behind the eye constriction. You can see the chimp is the same, right? If we put, the um, Sadiba is, there Mrs. Plays is, and can you see that Mrs. Plays, that forebrain is enlarged and there's less of a pinch behind the eyes. So it has got a smaller post-orbital constriction. And yeah, we have erectus. And again, um, Bit of a higher forehead, less of a constriction here. Pretty big eyebrow ridges though, eh? 
In fact, I would say even bigger eyebrow ridges than saliva. The gorilla. Large post orbital constriction and a very flat forehead, right? See these bony ridges on top of the um, gorilla skull? So these are ridges for the attachment of muscles. So the muscles for um, the lower jaw would be attached here. You can see that. Oh, it's quite the parietal crest. This big ridge is just for the attachment of very powerful muscles. And at the back here as well, very powerful muscles for attachment. So these gorillas have a powerful bite and they needed powerful muscles at the back of the skull to hold it onto the body. Like this. Humans, completely different. Hey, we've got this high forehead. Hardly any post-orbital constriction and small little eyebrow ridges. Although men have got larger eyebrow ridges than women, which should be worrying, right? And that's one of the way they tell male skulls from female skulls, the size of the eyebrow ridges. And then if we look at The lady, you can see sort of moderate eyebrow ridges, not much of a post orbital constriction. It's quite broad there, actually, for the lady. You can all see that. You must tell me if I'm sort of showing you something and, and you can't see it because of the camera, right? So you can compare the lady to a human. Two, something like Mrs. Blaise. Should we fill in the table? All right, so pantroglodytes, bipedal or quadrupedal? Hmm? Quadrupedal, right? Africanus, this is place bipedal or quadrupedal? What do you say? Can you remember? Anyone can answer? Hmm? Come, let's get somebody from the audience. Hey, Mrs. Plays, was she bipedal or quadrupedal? Um, there's bad. an answer. It says bipedal. Bipedal, right. Okay. Sediba, bipedal or quadrupedal? Bipedal. Mm. Erectus, from the name. Definitely bi. Bi, right? Gorilla, well, the quadrupedal, hey? We definitely yes. buy unless we babies. And the lady was? It was bipedal. Bipedal, yeah, all right. And then we look at the eyebrow ridges. So we can say, extra large, 
Africanus, medium, sediba medium, erectus actually large, gorillas extra, extra large. Think about t-shirt sizes, right? We have got pretty small ones with some, but there are exceptions with men, some men have pretty large eyebrow ridges, I reckon, and the lady medium. And then we looked at the, at the um, forehead. So yeah, you give me the answers. So for a chimp, did they have a flat or a vertical forehead? Can you remember? A vertical. Okay. Um, let me see. Yeah, we are. Um, where is that chimp one? You can see it's actually pretty flat, hey? So this would be flat. And a human would be vertical. So bearing that in mind, what would we say, say about the, the chimp? So that's flat. Africanus, flat or vertical? More flat, eh? Yeah. Sediba? Flat, huh? Erectus? Even though this is my favorite fossil, I must say that it's not exactly vertical. So I would just say flat, maybe slightly kind of expanded. And then the gorilla, definitely flat, hey? And then my uncle Albert, I'm proud to say, you know, nice vertical modern human skull. And the lady, pretty flat, eh? There you go. And now we can talk about the last thing, which is actually kind of one of these topics that is so fuzzy. Whenever these paleoanthropologists start talking about the connection between brain size or brain shape and intelligence, it's kind of like <clears throat> quite, 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 a difficult topic, <coughs> I find. But anyway, if you have a class, <coughs> let me use the other camera. <coughs> right. <coughs> and you've got one. <coughs> you know what? I'm going to have to go for a drink of water. I'll see you in a sec. <coughs>
There you go. Sorry about that. The problem with presenting from the vault is that you're not really supposed to have food and water in this place. But you can estimate the size of these skulls using a piece of string, the size of the brain of the skulls. So traditionally, what the paleoanthropologists did was they'd fill up the skull with sand. And the bigger the skull or the cranium, the brain case, the more sand that would fit in there. And then they would measure that in volume in cubic centimeters. Today, we would use X-ray machines, CAT scanners, micro CAT scanners, and then you can get a very accurate idea of the size and the shape of the brain. But say now you've got a class of kids and you've got these skulls and you just want to get an estimate of the brain size. All you can need is something like a piece of string, right? So you can put the piece of string behind the eyebrow ridges. I hope you can all see this. And you can take the string around the back. Let me try and show you. To the foramen magnum. Okay, there. And then you just measure it with a ruler. So for Homo erectus, if I'm just using a, a ruler and a piece of string, well, I get about 30 centimeters. And if we do the same thing with Sediba, so I'm taking the string from behind the eyebrow ridges to just where the foramen magnum starts. And we will get a length of about, I have my trusty ruler here, 20 centimeters, right? Now, now we need to discuss this though, but do you think that so clearly, Homo erectus at 30 centimeters appears, has a bigger brain size than Sediba. Um, do you think though, that you can just use brain size straight as a measure of intelligence? Is a human with a bigger brain more intelligent than a human with a smaller brain? Is a species with a bigger brain more intelligent than a species with a smaller brain? What do you think? So now, I'm looking for answers. Audience, is there anybody out there? Sure. Um. There is someone who says on the chat box, it depends on what you mean by intelligence. Aha. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> that's a good, a very good question. But would you say measuring intelligence is a very difficult thing. And with humans, there are multiple intelligences, aren't there? Some of us are good at some things. Some of us are good at other things, but would that person who's, who's asking that question, would you say that in general, a human would be more intelligent than say a dog? Yeah, someone what? says yes, probably. Probably. Okay, so we can get an intuitive sense of that humans are more intelligent than dogs. Would that person say that a human is more intelligent than a chimpanzee?
I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder. And it depends, eh? It depends. Yep. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I know that there's some tests that, that, that chimpanzees can do very well, like memorizing sequences of numbers, I think it is. There's a game that they play and they, and they far outperform humans. Um, but let's just say, for the sake of argument, that um, humans are pretty intelligent, um, but you can't really use just brain size as a gross estimate of intelligence, can you? Because a blue whale has got a much, much huger brain than a human. And um, <clears throat> yet we would consider ourselves very modestly to be more intelligent than a blue whale, right? So one of the estimates of the way, one of the ways you can use brain size, then they say, okay, if you've got a big brain on a small body, that means you are likely to be more intelligent because you've got all this processing power um, than an animal that's got a large brain on a huge body. So maybe it's like a car, you know, with a V8 engine on a, on a little sports car versus the V8 engine on an enormous 18-wheeler truck. So that's kind of one analogy that they use. So then they sort of work out the ratio of body size to brain size. And they say, well, if you look at brain size, you can't look at, gro at the, gro the gross brain size, but you have to, a more intelligent animal, you would expect to have a bigger brain on a smaller body. But then it gets more complicated than that. Then they start looking at um, the number of neural connections, the folds in the brain, how well developed is the forebrain. Um, and it actually becomes quite a complicated um, <coughs> exercise in trying to determine by looking at a, an extinct species and looking at the shape of the brain, the size of the brain, the size of the body, and to try and work out how intelligent this creature really was. Especially when we know that chimps and bonobos and, and dolphins and the crows and the many species out there that can actually do pretty amazing things. But I'm going to just give you the standard story, shall I? Um, so we can estimate the brain size of all these um, species here, even the extinct ones. And um, you're actually looking at not brain size, but the, the size of the cranium, the housing of the brain. You can look at their size and you can look at their body and you can get a feeling for how intelligent they were likely to be. And you can look at the tools that they might have made and at their culture. And we'll talk a little bit about that because tool making is kind of an indication of, of um, culture. Just to get a feeling, a sense of what were these creatures capable of doing. So it's really just a very broad brush um, view that you are getting by looking even with x-ray machines at the brain structure and there's still a lot of debate amongst paleoanthropologists about how do you tell from the brain size how intelligent the animals were how um, what they could do why did brains increase so dramatically in humans and blah 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 but let me just quickly give you the broad the broad picture so we're going to go back to share So if you are, so remember brain size is measured in cc or cubic centimeters, okay? So it's chip 300 cc. Now this is an average brain size and this is something else to think about. Um, males generally in primates are a bit bigger than females. So they don't have a bigger body, they don't have a bigger brain. You could take a hundred chimps and measure their brain size and you know how old that were, whether they were males or females. Um, but with the fossils, sometimes there is only one complete skull that you have and you, and you might be confident of whether it was a male or a female. You're not exactly sure how old it was. So you are basing your 
estimate of brain size or cranial capacity on maybe one specimen or two specimens. And the, all, these, the, all these uncertainties about the, the sex of that, how old it was and all that kind of stuff. So Africanus, 450, that's thought to be the average um, brain size in cubic centimeters. And a cubic centimeter is the same thing as a milliliter. Hey? So if you've got a 500 milliliter Coke, it's a 500 cubic centimeter Coke. Sediba, about 400. And that skull I've been showing you is estimated, was, is thought to have belonged to a 13-year-old boy, the one that I've been showing you all the time. Okay. So they don't really even have an adult so to really put to base their estimates on. Um, Erectus or Augusta, 850 cc. Gorilla, 500 cc. And gorillas have got these very large bodies, right? <clears throat> um, so you would expect them to have a larger brain just because there's this larger body that they have to control. Humans, about 1,450 um, on average, hey? And just think about all the human, the huge sample of humans that they can, have, that they measured to get this estimate compared to Africanus. And I think there's only, oh, only one, and I think Australia, Mrs. Pleasy is the most complete skull that they found so far. And then the lady, 550 cc, and there are actually two skulls of the lady. So you can see that we humans are definitely outliers when it comes to um, the size of the brain, we've got bigger forebrains, more folded, more connections. Um, so there is a story with the brain size as well. Chimps smaller. Um, <clears throat> and Erectus as well clearly has a much larger brain along with humans, although we have pretty big bodies, right? But still, if you work out a ratio of body size to brain, we've got the biggest brain. Um, for our size of body compared to the others. So that's the story. So now this is our data matrix. We've got all the, the characters. Um, I'm just gonna get my little pen. I can find it again. So yeah, we've got the species along the top and the characters around the bottom. And this is something that um, biologists, paleontologists love to do. They like to take characters like this in different species and create a family tree of who, like we have our own unique family trees. Trees, each of us has got our parents and our grandparents. Well, we like to do the same thing but for different species. Which species gave rise to which? So we tried to create a family tree of species and that's called the cladogram or phylogenetic tree. So what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna take this matrix, all these characters with all these species, and we're gonna create a very simple cladogram or phylogenetic tree for the species that we've been talking about. Right, so yeah, my cladogram is. And um, the first thing I want to know from you is what do you think? So this is, yeah, this is just like a family tree. The lines are lines of well, evolutionary lines of ancestors and descendants. What do you think the crosses are? And what do you think the circles are? Well, it's, 
approach it another way. If this is a family tree of humans and their close relatives, um, and if we were going to put humans here, who would we put here furthest away from humans? Of the species that I've been talking to, of showing you today, of the skulls, which would you say is the most distantly related to humans in an evolutionary way? Which is the most different uh, from us? Someone on the chat box says gorilla. Yeah, okay. All right, so we'll, so the gorilla, right? And then we're gonna put a human over there, okay? And I've answered my question. So the crosses here represent extinct species, okay? Now you don't normally find these on a phylogenetic tree, but I put them there anyway, just to kind of emphasize that these are fossils, those crosses. And the circles are common ancestors. All right, so we will talk a little bit more about that. Now, if which species that we have seen do you think is the most closely related to humans, to Homo sapiens? Um, someone says in the chat box, it's Erectus. Erectus, right? Okay, well, I got this right. So, yeah, okay. So, we're going to put Erectus there. Okay. And then who's next? Who do you think we should put there? So, we've got humans, Erectus. Who would you put there? Uh, say it's Naledi, someone in the chat. Naledi, great. And who would be there? Uh, someone in the chat says your friend. Uh, <laughs> Uh, maybe Uncle Albert, I don't know. And also someone says Sediba. Sediba, yeah, Uncle Albert's homo sapiens, eh? Mm -hmm. um, he's my uncle, so I'm very insulted that you should place him back there with Sediba. Yes, so Sediba, right? And that leaves a missing spot, right? For who's the missing one? Africanus. That's it, Mrs. Please, right. Okay, so you've already got an intuitive sense of how they are arranged, and of course, chimps are over there, right? And so the way these cladograms work, though, to make them do them properly and scientifically, and um, is you take all the characters and you use statistics, as many as you, as many characters as you have, like brain size, size of the eyebrow ridges, teeth, whatever. And you may take that matrix and you use pretty complicated stats and you work out which is the most likely evolutionary scenario, which, which, uh, uh, which species is most the closest to the other. So biologists spend a lot of time, if they're into this, into making cladograms, making huge matrices and, and getting computer programs and using statistics to, to work out which is the most likely order of evolution. But we can already tell, can't we, that humans and erectus share a big brain which the other species don't have on a relatively small body, right? I mean, that you, 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 we can all agree to. And another thing that they have in common is we've got long legs and fairly short arms. Erectus is exactly the same. Although gymnasts can do fantastic things, we are adapted to walking to a terrestrial lifestyle. We're not really adapted to living in trees, right? Whereas even the lady, even though it has this foot for walking, 
it's got this very powerful upper body and was clearly, clearly a very good climber. All right, so humans and erectus share a big brain and a, and a terrestrial lifestyle. Can we say that? And then the lady has a non-gripping foot, okay? The brain isn't as big as the others, and they have a body that is adapted for living in trees. Sadiba has got parallel cheekbones, which is, which is something that Naledi has erectus and sapiens. So, it, so Sadiba, Naledi, erectus, and Homo sapiens, and we've got this parallel, these parallel cheekbones, whereas all the others have got flaring cheekbones. And then if we look at Australopithecus africanus, it's got a small or medium canine tooth. There's no gap between the tooth and the, and the um, incisors. And this it has in common with Sediba, with Naledi, erectus and humans, right? And the other thing that it has in common with them is that it was probably bipedal most of the time. So it might have been living in the trees, but it was bipedal and it's got the small canine tooth. And that kind of those two characters are what distinguish human ancestors, hominins. That's what they, they are apes that are bipedal with small canine teeth and no diastema. So if you were walking around in the felt and you came across this fossil sticking out of a rock and you were lucky enough to find a skull and you saw that it wasn't human, maybe it had a, a very projecting or prognathous face, but if you could say that it was bipedal and it had a small canine tooth, then you'd have something very special. It would be a hominin. So it would be something that's more closely related to humans and shares these characters with them than to chimps and gorillas. Any questions about that? So you know what a hominin is now? The other thing maybe is that um, most primates are quadrupedal and most primates have got large canine teeth. So chimps, gorillas, monkeys, baboons, those are characters, are common primate characters, right? So you're looking for shared characters when you are classifying things. So you wanna prove Homo sapiens is more closely related to Homo erectus then the lady, you look at the characters that they've got that the lady haven't, that they share. And if they've got more characters that they share with one another than with the lady, then that's evidence that they more closely related to one another. Can you also see that Homo sapiens did not evolve directly from Homo erectus, but they share a common ancestor. Um, that common ancestor may have been a small population of, of Homo erectus, but we can't really say. So we say they share a common ancestor. And that's a common ancestor there between the lady and that branch there. And there's a common ancestor there. And there's a common ancestor there. So there's a whole bunch of common ancestors as we go along. We don't really say one species evolved. We don't say that one species really evolved directly into another. And I'll talk a little bit more about that just now. Okay. So now you know what a hominin is. Now, the other evidence that you can use is genetic evidence. And to basically, if you had a twin, you'd be 100% identical genetically, probably. You'd be 100%. You have very, very closely related genetically to your family. And the more differences there are between you, the less closely related you are. In other words, you had a, a common ancestor further back in time. Right, so the more differences, 
the further back you had a common ancestor and the fewer differences, that, that means you share a common ancestor more recently. And, I, and you'll see what I mean when I talk, I'll explain what I mean later on. All right. So we know you get DNA and in, actually it's become quite complicated, just floating around in the cells and things like that. But you usually find it in the nucleus and in the mitochondrion, okay? There's this DNA and the mitochondrion and the Y chromosome are especially useful when you're comparing different species, the sequences in them, because there's no crossover during meiosis. So the mitochondrial DNA just duplicates itself. Okay, and the Y chromosome, the same, it doesn't cross over. So if we look at a mitochondrial DNA, it's in a little loop like this. So this is from a mitochondrion. Remember the mitochondrion in the cell is this little, does all the cellular respiration. It's the energy, the little energy pro producing organelle inside the cell. So that it's got a ring of DNA in it, right? And each of these things here are actually genes. They code for proteins, right? But this little bit here does nothing. It just sits around there. And every now and again, there's a mutation um, when these little circles of DNA um, replicate. And those mutations are really useful because by counting the number of mutations between two humans, two groups of humans and between species, you can tell how long ago they had a common ancestor. So the more differences there are between your mitochondrial DNA and somebody else, the further back in time you had a common ancestor. And what I've got, so that's called the hypervariable region because it changes all the time. It doesn't code for anything. It's got no job. It just lies around in that, in that mitochondrial DNA and mutates every now and again. And the more mutations, the further back in time you had a common ancestor. So there, I've just taken a while and you can see that this would, could be your um, hypervariable region. That could be where you've got your mutations. All right, so now as an exercise for this workshop, normally what I ask people to do is they get given these sequences. There are 100 base pairs here, and this is a human. This is a chimp. That's a human. That's a gorilla. That's a human and a Neanderthal. We haven't discussed Neanderthals really, but they are close relatives of humans that were found in, the, in Europe during the ice ages, more or less. It's pretty complicated, the whole story. But yes, they are close relative of humans that lived during the ice ages and they started disappearing. They disappeared about 40,000 years ago. So what, what I ask people to do in the workshop is to just go along these strands and compare them and to count the differences. All right, so that's the difference there. There's a G there, there's an A there, there's a G there, there's an A there. So comparing Homo sapiens and chimps, those are the differences. A human and a gorilla, those are the differences. A human and a Neanderthal, those are the differences. And so on. You can compare chimps to gorillas, chimps to Neanderthals, gorillas to Neanderthals. And this is the answer that you get. So between a human and a chimp, using just those little bits of DNA, there are 13 differences between a human and a gorilla, 52 differences, and between a human and a Neanderthal, four differences, right? So you get the picture that um, we are slightly different from chimps, more different from gorillas, and very similar to Neanderthal. Now, this is a simple picture that I'm giving you. The reality is way more complicated, but I think it's useful, this exercise, just to get the concepts, right? So now between a chimp and a gorilla, 53 differences. That's a bit of a surprise, eh? And between a chimp and a Neanderthal, 10 differences. But between a chimp and a human, 13, 
and a chimp and a Neanderthal, 10. And between a gorilla and a Neanderthal, 54. So really the genetic evidence suggests that um, humans and Neanderthals shared a very recent common ancestor. And then we had a common ancestor with chimps further back and with gorillas even further back. But what's really interesting is that chimps and gorillas differ almost as much as humans and gorillas, suggesting that chimps and gorillas also had a, had a, had a common ancestor way, way, way back, much further back than you would think. Even though they look similar, the differences in that mitochondrial DNA, which doesn't have a job, remember, so it's not affecting the way they look or they function, they just little differences. Um, so, so chimps and gorillas had a common ancestor almost as far back as humans. <laughs> chimps and gorillas had a common ancestor almost as far back as humans and gorillas. Does that make sense? I'll show you again on the, on the next tree. So the number of differences tell you how far back you had a common ancestor. So identical twins would share 100% of the DNA. We humans are 99.9% .9 alike. Humans share 99.7% of the DNA with Neanderthals with evidence that there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and, and humans. We share 98.8% .8 of our DNA with chimps and 98% of our DNA with gorillas and 60% of our DNA with bananas. Right, now I want to show you one more thing before we sort of tie everything up and that is culture. Okay, so if you were walking around if you were an alien and you came to Earth long after humans were extinct and you found a TV set lying around in a dump, you could tell quite a lot about this, about the people that made that TV set. You would, could look at it, you could make inferences about the technology, about the industries they had. Um, you could tell a lot about humans just by finding that old TV set or a pot or whatever. So while our ancestors didn't make TV sets. They did make tools and they made them out of stone. And by looking at stone tools and the techniques that were used to make those stone tools, um, you can tell quite a lot about the mind of that species that made that stone tool. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to just go back to the other camera and I'm going to show you three stone tools. So we got one here. We've got three tools here. Okay. There's this one here. kind of pointy here, huh? like this. There's this one here, which is more pear-shaped. And there's this one here that's got a rounded edge, and you can see that it's actually got a sharp edge there. Eh? And now you're gonna ask me, but how do we know that these weren't just found lying around in the felt and that they were there by accident? Um, well, if you look at them, they've all been shaped pretty nicely. Um, this has got definite flakes taken out of it. It was shaped to give it a sharp edge. This pear-shaped one was beautifully shaped like this. And this one, yeah, as well. You can see the flakes and the archaeologists look for the bulb or per per percussion. And there are all sorts of clues that they use 
that, that tell you that these stones were actually shaped by something, by humans maybe. So just a quick question, which one of these tools do you think was most likely made by humans, modern humans? This one, this one, or this one? Anybody want to guess? All right, well, it's been a long session. So if you look at the tools, this one here, um, is possibly the simplest one. I've tried to make tools before and I'm useless at it. So I wouldn't say making any of these is simple, but can you see it's got a curve? It was probably a river pebble and then it was just bashed here to produce a sharp edge. So you can hold it like this and you could dig with it. You could sc scrape with it and you could cut with it. And in fact, archaeologists have managed to take apart an animal carcass using simple tools like these. So this is possibly the simplest one. It's called an Alderwan tool. And there's another species we haven't talked about today, Homo habilis, the handyman, who's normally thought to be the first tool maker. They go back 2.7 million years. Uh, but now there's a lot of debate about exactly who made these tools. So this is possibly the simplest, the older one too. And just with this simple shape though, you can see you can cut, you can scrape, you can bash, you can do a lot with it, just with this particular shape. This one here, the next one is called an Acheulean hand axe. This is my favorite one. I call this the smart stone. You've heard of a smartphone, right? Well, this one is a smart stone because you can do so much with it. You can dig, cut, grind, and bash, right? Hammer. So it's like a Swiss army pocket knife with a stone. This one could be more than a million years old. The earliest ones are about 1.6 million years old. Where is your smartphone going to be in 1.6 million years time? This one is still fully functional. And these ones, they normally say were made by Homo erectus. Well, the Homo erectus made a variety of tools. This one, these are normally ascribed to Homo erectus. Now this last point here is something that would have been maybe made by um, modern homo sapiens or close relatives. But can you see? It's got a specialized shape. The other two could have many, had many, many different purposes. They could cut, they could grind, they could bash. This one, somebody sat down and said, well, maybe I need a spearhead or an arrowhead or something like that, or I need to pierce something. And they actually sat down and planned it and produced a specialized tool for that very purpose, that point. And then there's evidence that some of these were tied onto a stick, they were hafted, and they, were used, they used string made of bark perhaps, or animal hide, they made glue um, with resin and ochre, they baked it hard. So humans, just like we are today, made life complicated for themselves. They produced specialized tools for specialized purposes. They could have been using poisons. So this is a Middle Stone Age tool, maybe made by modern humans. And so then we'll quickly go back. And now, now I'm just going to put everything together, talk about a few things, and then we can finish off because this is taking a little bit longer than I thought it was going to take. All right, so there we have the Aldi One Shopper. Okay, 
2.6 million years ago. They said, used to be believed Homo habilis made of it. General purpose, very simple shape, can cut, can um, scrape, grind perhaps. The Acheulean hand axe, normally ascribed to Homo erectus, with like the Swiss army pocket knife of stone tools, going back 1.6 million years. And this is a middle stone age point. And now this was just one particular, it's got a point, um, could have been used for boring, making holes in something, maybe tied onto a piece of wood um, for stabbing, piercing, whatever. Specialized tools for specialized purposes, and that's modern humans. Okay, so now let's quickly just look at our family tree again of humans and look at the times. On them. All right, so there you go. So modern humans have been around for about 300,000 years. Homo erectus from about 1.9 million years, okay, to 100,000 years. So Homo erectus were around quite recently, only 100,000 years they disappeared. So they probably may have coexisted with modern humans. Homo naledi between 300,000 and 200,000 years. Australopithecus sediba, 1.9 billion years. Um, Mrs. Pleas, between 3.3 and 2.1 million years. And chimps. The earliest chimp fossil is about 550,000 years old. But obviously, they're still with us today. And rather controversially, the oldest gorilla fossil may go back to 10 million years, but there's a bit of a debate. But you can see the one thing about this, this cladogram is that gorillas, um, we share a common ancestor with gorillas going back maybe 10 million years, but they still extend. They're still around today. Whereas there are many species that are more closely related to us that have disappeared from the face of the earth. All right, so we shared a common ancestor with chimps between six and seven million years ago, and a common ancestor with gorillas 10 million years ago. And that's kind of, so you can put a timeline on this um, cladogram of who evolved from who. And I know that for matrix, they have a, a difficult time understanding the cladograms and the time and the, the um, shared characters and how the whole thing works, because it's I've often been told by teachers that the students struggle with this. All right, so now what is it that tells us that we share a common ancestor with chimps and not with gorillas? And there are some kind of um, characters in the skeletons, but they're kind of obscure, like a similar wrist bone. And there actually isn't a lot. We don't share many skeletal um, characters with chimps, but we are genetically the most similar, right? And then one thing that we do share with gorillas and chimps, we lack a tail. We have a large size in general, although not all our ancestors did, not all the hominins. And we have a large brain relative to our body. And then just a couple of things. Often, if you're talking to people who argue about evolution and they, they say, and then they say humans evolved from monkeys, and no, we didn't. I mean, that is kind of, let me just get the. That gives you an idea. If this is a family tree, a cladogram that we kind of went zoops like this, and there was a jump straight from monkeys to humans. Did we evolve from chimps? No, we didn't. There wasn't a jump from chimps to humans. There was this common ancestor in between. Okay, so we, we share a common ancestor with chimps. Uh, but did we evolve from a common ancestor with monkeys or chimps? And yes, well, sort of, we did. I mean, there, the common ancestor with chimps is over there. 
and one line, branch gave rise to chimps eventually. There might have been many, many other species in between here, yeah? and one line gave rise to humans. Um, and then the, the, so what actually happened was that we share a common ancestor with Homo erectus. And then Homo erectus and humans share a common ancestor with Naledi on this cladogram. And Sediba and Naledi and erectus and humans share a common ancestor. So really between us and the common ancestor that we have with chimps, there are many, many, many other common ancestors. And over time, they sort of getting more and more human, having more human characters. So the change that we see between ourselves and the common ancestor with chimps really took place many millions of years, over many millions of years, and then many, many other common ancestors in between. It isn't like a sudden jump. And I think that's something that um, creationists, they don't understand that. And the other thing is they say, how come is it uh, if we evolve from chimps, chimps are still alive. Well, you can see we didn't evolve from chimps, but that common ancestor, maybe there was like a small population of this common ancestor, and then it split in two, and one line gave rise to chimps, and the other line gave rise to humans. So it's perfectly logical that we should still be alive today as are chimps, if we look after them anyway. And then the last Another question is, is there progress in evolution? And maybe we can ask that to you. Um, is there progress? And that's when we were talking about what do you mean by intelligence? And um, it depends, how do you judge intelligence? How do you judge progress? Because gibbons and gorillas and chimps are beautifully adapted to their forest habitat. And if we didn't have our technology, we would not really fare well in the forest at all compared to chimps and gorillas. Um, our technology can be very destructive as well. So when you're talking about progress, what do you mean? I think that's a very important question. And just then there's this very famous picture from Time Life and it sort of gave this linear idea of evolution. And whenever you see a picture talking about evolution, it's kind of like there's this line from there to there. And this is progress, right? This is improvement. And well, I hope that you've seen this afternoon that we can talk more about an evolutionary tree with lots of branches and randomness. We can debate exactly what progress is. And this is a very misleading picture. Even though the people who put it together really didn't mean it to be interpreted this way, but it was, you know, and there, there's a male there at the end, you know, whatever, and oh, there's so many misinterpretations of that. And I think the last thing I want to say that if you want to find out more about human evolution, I think the best resource out there is the Smithsonian Institute's webpage on human origins. Um, you, it's got these beautiful trees. You can click on any of them, find out about the species, where they were found, who found them. It's really got a lot of, um, of detail on human evolution. And of course, here at Fitz, we also have um, uh, um, this wonderful resource in the vault here. And we've got a poster. You can go via Southeast Africa. You could contact me. And this just looks at um, species that have been found in South Africa and tells you who found them, when they were found, and gives you more information about them. And I'll be very really happy to provide anybody that wants a poster like that with this. And I think that's the end. And if you're still here, maybe I can quickly show you around the hominin vault. What do you, what do you think? Are you still there? Yes, um, and Paul, do you want to come in and just do a quick thank you and then we can do the tour afterwards? Um, yes, thank you. We would like to say thank you to everyone who participated today and to everyone who actually made time for the webinar. And also say thank you to Doc. Thank you. Thank you so much for 
the knowledge that we've gained today and your time. So thank you so much. And also someone from the chat box, Fiona says, um, it was very interesting. So she's also thankful for that. It's a pleasure. Any burning questions? If there's anyone who would like to ask a question, so you can do so by dropping on the chat box or raising the hand. Sure. Um, so, Ian, I think, do you want to do the tour and we can check if there's any questions afterwards? Um, That's it. And while I, because I've got to like, disconnect this video camera so I can walk sure. around with it, why yeah. don't you guys fill in the poll while I do that? Uh, okay, cool. So we're going to launch the same poll again to see if um, people, what people have learned during the session. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> and right. Hopefully, cool. hopefully <laughs> something. Yes. And I do okay. apologize. It took a bit longer than I thought it was going to take. Um, it's the first time I've done the whole thing like this. So, yeah, I, I don't apologize. know. It was fascinating. Okay, so I'm launching the poll again and you can see if everyone can the answers now. Okay, so I think all the answers have come in that are going to come in. Um, oh, it's great. Well, there you go. So that looks like they all were pretty correct, huh? Thank you. Okay. So do you want to see this? Can I show you around now? Absolutely. Just stop your screen share so that we can see your picture. Yeah. Or swap it, whatever you need to do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that. Stop sharing. All right, so this is the computer that you've been looking at. So this is the hominid vault, um, which is 
contains Sediba and Muledi and Rufut, amongst other places. And I'm just going to show you around quickly. So what you can see here is these are just reference specimens. So we've got a huge reference collection of replicas of um, hominins and apes and primates from all over the world that can be used to compare to the fossils that are found here. And they are literally thousands and thousands, even in this little lab. So you can just, if you just look at the shelves, you can get an idea of how many hominin um, fossils have been found in each. And these are the replicas of them from all over the world. So I think that's pretty impressive because people don't realize actually how many specimens have really been found. In the suitcases over there, that is, as far as I know, that is Homer Naledi. So those are all the fragments of Homer Naledi. And of Homer Naledi alone, I can't remember exactly, but I think there were a thousand specimens that were found. Down there is a reconstruction of, that is Australopithecus sediba. So there, that is what the little fella looked like. So these little hominins were not, most of them were not very big at all. I mean, this little guy, a well, 13 year old boy, he would have taken you up to your hip, right? So they were really very small. Look at the long arms, um, the curved hands. So Sediba would have been a great climber, very powerful upper body. And this here is, so I'm attached to the computer by a cable. So you must just excuse me, I've got to just untangle myself here. This here is Sediba itself. So this is the skeleton here. So have a look at that there. That's kind of the reconstruction. And this here, it's actually a replica. is kind of what they found. And there are a whole bunch of pieces here that haven't been put in place. But you can see that it's quite a skill reconstructing a skeleton like this and to work out exactly how it moved about. Now I'm gonna show you one of my favorite specimens. I don't know how close I'm gonna to get to it. But here is this is where we run out of time. All right, can you see this? Okay. This is the town child found in 1924 in Northwest province in town, which is about 80 kilometers north of Kimberley. And it was the very, very first hominin that was found in Africa. A four year old child still has its milk teeth and um, Prof. Lieberger has evidence that it was actually um, captured by an eagle or something like that because it's got puncture marks in the skull where the eagle's claw fit in, fits in. So this is actually the real town child. And at the top left, you can see and a, what would you call it? A cast of its brain, the face, and then there's the little, little lower jaw over there in the bottom right. And now what I'm gonna show you here is one of the most complete hominin specimens that have ever been found. This is Littlefoot. And the story of Littlefoot is that Prof. Ron Clark and his team 
think it was in 1992, um, Ron Clark found the little ankle bones of this specimen in a box over at medical school. And he knew where in the Stagfontein caves they came from. And he and, and his team basically went into the caves and searched the particular chamber where those ankle bones came from and found the rest of the skeleton. And then it took them many years and little foot was finally revealed to the to the world, well, I think about three years ago. And it was a huge task to uncover this specimen here. So this is Australopithecus prometheus. That's the name that's been given to it at the moment. There you go. Is there anything else you'd like to see? My very rough tour of the of the of the vault. It's fascinating, and well, you you tell us what else is of what is there. Um, so I just want to check with everyone one more time if there's any questions or comments for for Ian. Please unmute yourself if you'd like to. To ask anything. Um, just give people a sec. I would just like to say again, many thanks to be able to have a look inside that vault while I'm sitting in the Eastern Cape. It's just wonderful. So sometimes technology is good, but I'm not sure it's equated with intelligence necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. Cool. Um, thanks so much, Ian. I think that's it. Um, it was a fascinating talk and tour. And thank you for uh, rescheduling after the mishaps of the previous session. Um, and thank you to all the attendees for joining us. We will post a recording of the session on the SciFest website if there's anyone else that you want to point to it. All right. Mm. Thanks so much. Thank you Ian. very much. Okay. And thanks for your patience. It's seven minutes past four. Wow, <laughs> I can't believe that. <laughs> okay. All right. Absolutely then. no problem. Bye.